Packer Nation, you asked for a Christmas miracle and you got one. We needed the whole entire universe to align here this weekend, going four for four for games outside of the Packers winning. And then you asked for us beating a legitimate opponent, a playoff team, and you got one with that Christmas victory against the Miami Dolphins. So with that being said, happy holidays to all the Packers on the Rocks fans. And let's go ahead and, and welcome in episode 10. Merry Christmas, Dave. Cheers. Hey, Merry Christmas. That's the best uh, present we've had on the tree all year. So it made, it, it made my Christmas without a doubt. Yeah, I know. I was uh, kind of stuck at some family obligations, so I had to record it. And I was just texting before the game, like, please do not text me anything. And then I get a smiley face from you at like 310. I'm like, all right, well, I know how this went, so at least I can enjoy the game once I watch it. I couldn't hold myself. It's like two two brothers growing up, and underneath the the tree is the present they've all always wanted. One of the brother peeks underneath the, the gift wrapping, and they can tell what the present is, and they can't help but let, let their other sibling know exactly what it is. But right, hey, with, right. that, with that being said, let's, let's go ahead and, and dive right into this Christmas-themed episode and, and starting off with really the – the main reason why we won this game, the defense and all the different Christmas presents that they gave us. So Joe Barry gets to keep his job, right? Cause I mean, that first half was woof. Like I, I was having a hard time wrapping my brain about what there was so much to smile about from your text message, watching the first half, but the second half, they really, they really turned it up a notch. I apparently, uh, Jerry Gray was cussing in the locker room, firing him up, and they said, oh, we have to play better the second half. So that apparently that's what sparked them. And then and the, the million-dollar question is, did Tua get rattled by our uh, pass rush in the second half and turned into Tim Tebow wobbly passes that went straight into our, our mitts uh, for Jair Campbell as well as Rasul? Or have, have we finally figured out how to play – zone the proper way and sinking into your proper zone and passing off receivers and being in the spot that you should be in. That's, That's the million a, dollar question for what happened in that second half. I actually think Tua exploded more than we caused it because there was, it didn't look like guys were necessarily jumping routes and stuff. It looked like Tua was throwing it right to them. I mean, the Campbell pick, he dropped back into zone and, and went right into the spot. And then the Douglas pick, it looked like they were playing man there, and Douglas actually jumped back on to the far route instead of keeping his guy on the shorter route. But the one that Jair was right to him. And there was four Packers around Jair. So it looked like two was starting to kind of see ghosts almost. It was. That, that was thanks to Preston Smith, who's balled out the past three games. Yep. Whether it doesn't show up in the stat sheet as, as much as he's playing a huge role in it. Justin Hollins had a few nice pass rush. Devontae Wyatt had the most Wyatt. snaps. Yep. 24 of his of his Packers career in his rookie season. So I, I, I think it is a part of that. So And it's like asked the question of, hey, can we carry this over with us when we decide to play zone against – Justin Justin Jefferson and the Vikings. But that that is that is jumping ahead and turning yeah. the page next game. The, I mean, they are playing great defense in crunch time. They've gone three games now without allowing a point in the fourth quarter. So there is something to be said about that. That is a trend now. Where come the second half, come the fourth quarter, they're, they're clamping down, they're doing something right. So first three quarters or at least two, like you can't play as soft because Waddle had was just going up berserk off them and then the replay showed Rodgers missing a wide open to Watson on that fourth down and the very next play they hit Hill on that deep bomb and that's you know there's just there's something about the first half or at least the first quarter where uh, I don't know there's Barry just wants to play 20 yards off and let them have their way with us and then oh okay it's time to play good defense I guess we'll actually try now because I, I can tell that LaFleur and the rest of the coaches, or at least he was, he was terrified of this Miami's offense, yeah. turning it into a shootout, marching down the field to where we go 
we go for a fake punt to run Levitt up the A-gap where you're trying to steal possession, like he said. And I think one of, one of the major plays of the game, or even players, is Jaron Reed, who had a sack, and I think he had the most crucial turnover out of those four to where we went three and out on offense. The Dolphins got the ball back with less than three minutes to go in the first half. They're up 20 to 10, mm-hmm. and they're driving. Jaron Reed causes a fumble, and we get it at, like, the Dolphins' 40-something yard line. We turn that into three points. To play the what if game, if they continue driving, they could turn that into 23 to 10 or even 20 to 7 to 10, leading into halftime. And I think that's that's your ball game. Yep, that's the turning point. It's your like NBC turning point where they show like up to that point. Yeah, but I think 23 10, it gets really tough. I think 27 10, it, it's ball game. Like, but the other kind of crucial point too was the Campbell pick because they're driving on that drive. They're at our 30. It's at least three, maybe seven. And then we, once Campbell got that pick, um, there's kind of like that exhale. It was kind of like, okay, we're, we're back in charge of this thing. Um, But uh, I mean, going to your point, cause we we're talking about this before we jumped on here, but uh, you don't want to see injury. Um, but Wyatt had a great game after Lowry kind of couldn't go anymore. And if that, you can't lose your job injury, but it happens all the time. And if that's what happened, I actually think the team gets better with Wyatt slowly getting better game by game, getting more snaps than having Lowry, who we've known who he is for the last six, seven years. And it goes to our coach's philosophy of we need to, roll these rookies out slowly unless it's a must like playing Quay Walker from day one where they are treating him a lot like Rashawn Gary who played less than 10% of stats, even though we, we both know he was raw and wasn't ready. Um, but now Devonte Wyatt, where it brings up another question, the way our whole entire coaching staff has, has treated things. Now he has 24 plays that you've seen put on film, a lot of good in there. Come these two final games, do you think he continues at that sort of percentage of snaps? Or it's like, hey, if Dean Lowry is a go for these last two games, we'll we'll, we'll go with the way things usually are, business per usual, and and the l- reluctancy to change with this. I, th- snap. I think next week he gets more snaps if Lowry could still go, just because they're they have the excuse of Lowry's on a snap count because he got hurt, and we're bringing Wyatt up. I think once Lowry becomes fully healthy, I think it goes back to he gets like anywhere between 10 and 20% of the snaps. Although I think it should be completely flipped. I think Wyatt should be getting 75% of the snaps and Lowry should be getting 25%. It's just that obvious. So like Wyatt was starting, once he started getting some snaps and getting into the flow, he started really wrecking the lineup scrimmage. And in his pass rush ability too, I think that's one of the biggest reasons they drafted him is because of his, mm-hmm. his first step and the, the quickness that he has. And there was a couple different plays where that's when Tua starts to get get rattled. He's seeing ghosts of Christmas past. And then speaking of the pass rush, too, we joked about it here in the, in our, our pre-show prep, uh, a long pre-show prep at that. Uh, Joe Barry's uh, game plan heading into this game, which was we need to tackle better. <laughs> yeah. That could be, hey, playing things close to the best. At the same rate, though, one thing I noticed that was prevalent in this game we played three outside linebackers, three pass rushers on a on a real healthy amount of downs where Quay's lined up smack dab right next to Enigbare or Justin Hollins or Preston Smith. What what do you think about that sort of it's not a psycho uh Packer yeah. dating back to the Dom Caper days, but that was like finally a change that uh Barry made to this to this sort of Dolphins offense. That could be a very – it could be a, like like you mentioned, bringing the, the rookies slowly. It could be just they wanted Walker to handle middle linebacker responsibilities and dropping back into zone and, and reading the run and not worrying about pass rush. But tell you what, this defense is playing better ever since they started bringing Walker on voices and letting him rush the passer. Like, he's not necessarily getting home all the time, although he did last week, but he's starting to disrupt stuff. Like, and they're having an account for him, and it, it's just another little thing on his plate, and I, I like the wrinkle. 
It is. And I think it lets uh, Devondre Campbell play more of his natural position. And, and yes. what he was so great at last year at his all pro level where he's, this is this year we played predominantly two inside linebackers on majority of downs where last year, yes, Chris Barnes was in there, but the plays that Devondre Campbell flourished, he was the lone lone inside linebacker in there. And Quay Walker, I, I brought this up beginning of the season. I'm like, he reminds me like a poor man's Micah Parsons. Play him outside, play him inside, utilize yeah. that athleticism to the fullest. We're just not creative enough. Like you see stuff happening with like Devin White and stuff down in Tampa, which Walker has the build and the speed for, but we're just not creative enough. But flipping over to the offense. What uh, what did you see and think there? Keeping it on on the on the topic of, of Christmas and and doing my best to spin it to one of my all time favorite Christmas movies, Elf. So while it's not a drink of the game or a cheer or a jeer, I think Elf does describe or portray um, the Will Ferrell as the main character. I think it portrays Aaron Rodgers in this game. We remember in the movie Elf where uh, Buddy um, doesn't start off on the right foot with his biological dad and coming to uh, the U.S. to meet his father and he's all pissed off at him through a majority of the movie. But if you look at it, it has a real nice positive end and silver lining where Buddy the Elf saved his biological dad's publishing company by giving him a biography of Buddy the Elf, which was able to save his biological father and he formed a really nice relationship with his brother there and i think this uh coincides with aaron Rodgers, where there's a lot of things that he did in this game to frustrate myself other packer nation out there but in the end he had a few really nice roger s throws to save the day and do just enough to get us get us over this hump what, what were your thoughts when when taking a look at this game and uh, from start to finish, the way that uh, Aaron Charles Rodgers, our back-to-back MVP, played in this game? Um, A lot of what we've seen this year from him, but then sprinkle in some MVP throws, right? Like the throw to Lazard down the sideline, just dropping it in the bucket. And then you have Watson breaking open on the fourth down that he just overthrows by 10 yards. It's kind of like been like that all year. In no different than this game where you sprinkle in some wild throws and a lot of we haven't seen that ever before in Aaron Rodgers and it's been like that all year right and what didn't help was the run game like just kind of slipping in the backfield or getting you know two fingertips on your heel when you had that third down run that he could have just Dylan could have just sprung into the end zone but he gets like just nicked and falls down and you have so much out zone out uh zone run plays that just you're stretching it and you're just not getting anywhere on it and then Lazard's drops and then you have really good throws in tight coverage from Dobbs so it's just kind of a you can look at this game on the rewatch and say wow the offense played great and you can also look at it and say wow the offense played terrible it's kind of just one of those weird cookie games I lean more towards the latter I, I had made a note that we had three gifts that were presented to us from the defense, along with Nixon, which we'll get to here in a, in a bit. Uh, but there was three gifts that we turned into field goals. We struggled in the red zone to convert those to touchdowns. And, and you brought up it's something that's been a reoccurring theme all season long, but yet we continue to have these sort of outlet passes. Rodgers can't hit a check down to save his life. No. He'll get it here and there, but there was like a third and two. He was miles off of Dobbs, but that was his his read the whole entire time. The fourth and two to Watson, he missed him by three yards, but also why are we running uh, four deep routes on fourth and two instead of scheming, scheming somebody open with that? I, I saw Rodgers hit a couple of passes, one to Lazard, one to Big Dog down the sidelines. And a couple of things which I think over there was a really good NFL throw there. over the middle to Dobbs. There was a really good throw to Dobbs over the middle. Um, the one person I do want to kind of shout out on offense, it was kind of a really big play, but then it gets lost in the shuffle. Is 
Patrick Taylor had two really good reps. The one to Big Dog, Patrick Taylor picks up the blitz and just stonewalls someone to give Rodgers enough time to throw it to Big Dog. The second one was he chip blocks and then catches the check down and runs it for the first down on like third and 12, which was a monster play at the time. And before that, our third down conversions were were abysmal. And that was a thir- third and long that we definitely needed to convert at that point in the game. You're right. That that pick that pickup was very nice. And I think Aaron Jones has had some nagging, lingering injuries that they're yeah, not, he's not right. They're, yeah, and they're not talking about I think he had like 30% of the snaps throughout this game. But yeah, that blitz, blitz pickup. And I'll 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 give some credit to Buddy the Elf, aka Aaron Rodgers. That arm trajectory that he had to Big Dog and watching, he throws it like that and it comes out and it's it's right on the money. There's other times though where he has Nixon gift him inside the red zone. Very first play, he takes a 20 yard sack when he has Cobb. Yeah. I think he still could have fit it in that window, sitting in the soft spot of the zone, open. Or there's another play to Lazard that he's not reading the middle of the field very well this year. And then also his check down passes are off the mark more often than they're on. I think that the middle of field stuff still has to do with Devontae. Because he never used to go he didn't never really went over the middle of the field that often, if you think about it. Like once Jordy left and some of those guys left, he never really Devontae was a boundary receiver and he'd throw these he'd throw the comebacks or he'd throw the like outside fades and stuff like that to Devonte. He's a outside the numbers type quarterback and he doesn't like Tunyon. He just ignores now. Like, <laughs> so I, the only time you really see him go over the middle of the field are those strike plays, those play action strike plays that he just zips it into Dobbs. And that's for That's been a bread and butter play that I think we should run at least three. I mean, you have to get the run game going yeah. to, to open it up, but that's been our, that's been our money ball play all season long. But, it was a lot of up and down, and I – run game has kind of been a hit or miss this year, and I can't fault them for not sticking with it because it just wasn't going anywhere. And then he kind of – you had – like I said, it was kind of a weird, wacky game all around where there's glimmers of, oh, man, where's that been all year? And then you kind of get away from it. Um, and then there's been just throws that look – completely awful like he like you said he can't hit a check down and he was off page with Randall Cobb a couple of times that is very unusual and Lazard dropped a couple of third downs and um the offensive line was holding up until Nyman went out and then he Mm -hmm. put Newman at right tackle and then everything was caving in on him I was just about to ask you how you thought Royce Royce Newman held up and no (laughs) And that 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 also could be the reason why Rodgers is looking to get rid of the ball extremely quickly. Yeah. Or uh, say I I can tell that he wanted to put this team on his back for this game. The off schedule plays he picked up a couple of nice first downs to extend drives, but playing within the offense that that's not been his mo. And we got people falling down in the backfield. I'm like a lot of this stuff us stubbing our toe. This is a microcosm of this whole entire season. Royce held up about as well as my daughter waiting for Christmas Day on San- for Santa. <laughs> I mean, she, she it was really tough putting her to bed, and it was really tough saying, no, you got to wait till 6, 7 o'clock in the morning to, to open your presents. Royce was uh, back putting him pretty far into Roger's lap most of the night. Um, there's, that, there's, not, like, there's not much we can do. Caleb Jones, who's been on some sort of season illness, list all season long he's huge he's like six foot eight i think they should have been playing him at fullback like how the uh yeah. 49ers will do their left tackle and trent williams but well um you mentioned him earlier he went out but thoughts on Keyshawn? i'm ready to give him the packers mvp for this season he's changed w- w- watson well watson has had like one of the biggest tears I we've all ever seen in a rookie player or any sort of wide receiver. I I do believe there's there is some sort of uh he's he's suspect to injury or injury prone. Oh, now yeah. he now he has the hip, a couple of concussions, 
He has knee injury when you're built like he is, and he's specimen. I think he does expose himself to the, those sort of injuries. So I'm, I'm, I'm a bit hesitant on giving him the MVP, but Keyshawn Nixon, he has a re aggravating groin injury. He opens, opens up his very first kick with a 93. So 93 yarder to give us three points. The yep. very next kickoff that they have, they do a squib kick because they're terrified of him. Just like we were terrified of Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle in the yep. first half and, and beating us over the middle or Tyreek beating us deep. But Keyshawn Nixon, he gave us at least three, if not 10 points. And he, he, didn't, he didn't even play majority of the game. The funniest thing that they kept pulling up on the broadcast was that we had three plays for negative nine yards and he had three points. Like, <laughs> because Keyshawn Nixon just ran it back. I, you could tell by, like, the 20, 25-yard line, he was just exhausted. Like, Dolphins started catching up to him, and it was just like, can we hold their block to get in? But he's – He's something special, man. I've been bringing it up for the last three or four weeks. I mean, it's been a revelation. I hope we could go next week and a little bit kind of the um, kickoff defense team, Carpenter and Gaines, both with great tackles. Like, that's kind of slowly turning around. Like, finally, you're kind of seeing dividends for uh, bringing in Basaccio. It is. It's been like the past four weeks or whenever Amari Rogers was finally shown the door and exit stage left. They have really started to click. Well, a lot of it's Keyshawn Nixon, and he's a one-cut, find the lane. But like in the Dolphins game, you go back and watch that 93-yarder, which he leads the NFL in like three-plus yeah. kick returns for 50-plus yards, and he's only played at that spot for how many years. But anyways, like there was a pretty decent hole that he hit. Oh, yeah. That is because of that, that kickoff return team. It makes you wonder if there's always been holes there, but Amari never found them. Like – Nixon looks like he sees it and just cuts and goes. Like, Amari was kind of dancing back there. But Amari's actually doing okay in Houston. But this is a Packer podcast, so we'll stick to Packers. Um, what's the road ahead look like for us, bud? The road ahead, our playoff percentages, I want to say at this point, which we needed to have the Commanders lose this weekend. We needed the Seahawks to lose. The Lions along with potentially one other, the, the Giants as well, even though they need to lose out. But we needed four things to go in our favor, along with other things this past week. And I think we started off at like 3% two weeks ago. And now we're at, what, 29% chance, if not more, of getting into the playoffs. And to some extent, we, we control our own destiny, these final two games. We need a little bit of help, but only one thing needs to happen, and the commander's – either losing to the Browns or losing to the, the Cowboys in the season finale. Yeah, we kind of we kind of gained a few outs. So um, Washington and the Browns play at noon next week. We play at 315. If the Browns beat the Commanders at that noon slate, the Packers control their own destiny by kickoff. So there's – I mean, now there's a few other outs too where um, if the Giants lose out, and we win out, we're in. If the Commanders lose one of two, and we win out, we're in. And then if the Commanders lose out and the Packers win one of two, we're in. Basically, the Seahawks – oh, I think the Seahawks at that point would also have to lose out. But, yeah, we got the Giants to lose, we got the Seahawks to lose, we got the Commanders to lose, we got the Lions to lose, and we won. So we went five for five on Christmas, man. I don't I don't remember being this, this – uh... This much of good behavior, behavior to be on the nice list for Santa to be given this many presents from him this whole entire year. I remember it was against the Commanders and the Lions that were like the the, the announcer like the season's on the line here for the Packers. They need to win this game or they can kiss the playoffs goodbye. I I was under the same impression. I wasn't ready to call it run the table 2.0. And I want to say that you've been somewhat on the fence or you don't want to put your emotions on the line for it yeah. and, and suffer another heartbreak. But like the universe tends to be aligning where it, it can happen. And to that million dollar question earlier of uh, whether we found something on defense with the zone or is more so Tua turning into Tebow, you got to believe that Joe Barry is going to continue to play that style of zone defense yeah. against Justin Jefferson, who now is in sole possession of, 
the Vikings uh, most most receiving yards in the whole entire season past Randy Moss. Like how how are we playing him next this this upcoming Sunday? Because that's really the key to the victory. The most obvious thing to do, which we saw from the first week, would be to put Jair on him. Like here, that's your guy. Like have at it. We're paying you twenty million dollars a year. Like it should be no problem for you. What I see happening is how we handle everything, how we've always handled everything. Oh, we're gonna play zone if if Jordan Jefferson or uh, Justin Jefferson lands up against so and so. Well, that's the coverage we're in, and that's just what we're gonna play. So, um, yeah, I'd like to see there be some type of change up, but I I don't have my hopes up for the defense. I mean, maybe the offense comes alive. I mean, the thing with the Vikings is their record and their point event uh, differential are two completely different things. So it's kind of like what Vikings team are you going to get? They're, they're, they're 11. And I, I hate playing this statistical game because you can start getting into, Oh, when the, the wind's blowing over 10 miles an hour on the yeah. second Tuesday of the month, there are two, two key stats though, to think about LaFleur said it uh, um, in his little uh, post game interview with the, the rock, Larry McCarron, that ele- the, the Vikings are 11 and 0 in one score ball games, which yeah. is a record at the same time. And I've always said this about Captain Kirk or Kirko Cousins, whatever they're calling him with the gold chain and the the the, the designer glasses on. Outside <laughs> outside of noon games, Kirk Cousins' record is not great. Yeah, it's and I've terrible. always I've always believed that Kirk Cousins will throw you a couple of uh gifts as well. And we've been opportunistic with those the past few weeks. So the key question now is, with Rodgers having the most interceptions since 2010, is this a 2016 team or is this a 2010 team? It's neither. Okay. And, that's, and that's okay. Well, well, the media tries to press Aaron into giving a, a run the table type quote, and, and he won't. And When does he give it? When does he give the run the table quote? Or is he not saying we're going to run the table an indication that he knows what this team is? That could be a, it's a quote without saying a quote. He's yeah. one, one, one step ahead of us. And and we'll, we'll save the, the Rogers. Uh, what, what's he going to do and what needs to happen to get him to come back versus retiring for all we can, we can have that be a whole complete separate. Episode. Yeah. We got hours of, of off-season content covered. But right now, this is – this shaping up to be a more exciting season than we thought. Like, we thought we were going to get into top five draft uh, draft discussion by probably this week. And now we're talking, oh, man, we just need one game to fall our way and we're, we're rocking in the playoffs here. And think about it. It's going to be at Lambeau as long as we can – if we can keep Justin Jefferson under 120 yards, I like our odds. A.J. Dillon – have the offense flow through him under center. And from what I know, Christian Watson may be able to play this Sunday. I think a lot of it is contingent upon that. He was, yeah. he had five catches for 49 yards. I think he was bound for a hundred yard game if he doesn't go out um, there in the third quarter. But do you, do you think he plays as Bach playing? That's a separate story, but our health is now somewhat in check. Royce Newman now needs to be, Rolled out against Darius Smith and Daniel Hunter, who could have a have a field day with him being. Do you know in what's going? Do you know what's going on with Nyman? Nyman, I don't know. I don't know how banged up Nyman is. I hope he could play. Um, Watson looked like he was trying to go and then just couldn't. I think Watson plays. Keyshawn, I hope plays. I think Keyshawn's actually a huge factor in this. Um. And then outside of that, I think Wyatt is actually better than Lowry. So I like I hope Lowry's good health wise, but if he doesn't play, it's not like a step back. But your three guys are Nixon, Watson, and Nyman. I think Nyman actually is probably the biggest one. You put Royce Newman out there against those two licking their chops as pass rushers. And we've They're seen going how, to. And we've we've seen how Aaron Rodgers has been. When he starts to feel the rush and he turns it into, I'm going to pitch it, pitch it deep with these shot plays time and time again. So I, 
I think I think all all those play a pretty pretty hefty role. I think you have three options at the offense at right tackle. You can if Bach plays, you move Zach Tom to right tackle, or yeah, you move Zach Tom to left guard or right tackle. Like Zach Tom goes right tackle, Bach, and then you just keep uh, Jenkins and Bach next to each other. If Bach goes, you can move Jenkins to right tackle and play Zach Tom at left guard. There's there's options. I just don't want Newman, but uh, we'll wrap this thing up, man. Um, got our final thoughts in. Hope the holidays were good to you. They were. This this is this is more more than I could ask for in a Christmas style present. As as an adult, when you typically get gift cards and clothes. So there you go. All right, cheers, man. I got nothing left in the cup after this episode. Happy holidays, Dave, and a yeah, merry merry well. Christmas. <laughs>